Yeah, hi. Um, so good news and bad news. Um, bad news is uh, David Byrne is not here. He's not going to sing for you. Um, good news, I'm not going to sing either. Uh, <laughs> so shamelessly stole that title from an old Talking Heads record, but I'm going to talk, as you might expect from me, about um, C++. So, um, yeah, the, the usual, where are we in our endeavor of uh, keeping up with the C++ versions in our LibreOffice code base? Um, there hasn't been that much activity recently, so we're still, since 5.1, we're still with the same uh, tool chains that we support as the baselines. That's uh, GCC 4.7 and the Microsoft uh, 2013 compilers. Um, we've kind of reached, uh, I think we've kind of reached a, a spot there where the compilers are good enough to support many of the things that we actively use in the code and there's not that much that we desperately long for that would be available if we, if we bump the baseline. So we kind of, yeah, um, ran a bit out of uh, enthusiasm to, to, to push further because every bump of, of uh, baseline, of course, means that somebody feels left behind or some, some things that some machinery that used to work uh, needs to be updated as well and it will, wouldn't work anymore. So um, if you look at the features that we don't have yet where we would benefit from the 2015 compiler or in some cases they wouldn't also be supported by GCC 4.7 and would need 4.8. Um, if you look at that list, it's mostly things that we've kind of covered. So, for example, const expressions, um, we do have a, a configure time check for those and uh, then have macros around features where we benefit from, from having these available in the code, but in a way that if they are not available on the compiler, then the code still compiles, but maybe does something compute something at, at runtime that it would otherwise compute at compile time, so there's not much lost there. The, the, the ref qualifiers on the functions, um, that's mostly a feature to, to catch um, users of, like when you use a function that modifies the, the, the a member function that modifies the object, and you call that on a temporary, and uh, the effect of modifying the temporary is get lo got, gets lost afterwards. Um, that's a bug in your code, and, and you, 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 you misused that function and didn't notice. Um, we can uh, catch those with ref qualifiers, and we do in some cases, um, and that only then warrants on the compilers that we use that. Thread safe statics, we have this ugly um, RTL static stuff to cover these for the Microsoft, and, and still use that on the Microsoft compiler. Um, so that's all things that um, we, we would benefit from them. We do benefit already from them. So there's, uh, yeah, we, we'll keep it at that. Um, the one thing that we might uh, find interesting in some places is um, that our Unicode or, or our Unicode string support, we have that Zal Unicode type def um, which on platforms that do support native Unicode UTF-16 uh, type, the CAR-16T type. Um, we use that one internally now. On Microsoft, we still use that WCAR-T thing internally. Um, so if we had uniform support for these uni Unicode string laterals with a U um, in front of the string literal, then we could do... Um, in some places, we have non-ASCII string literals in the code that we want to repre represent in some way. So what we do there now is to do a static array of Zal Unicodes and then put in the, the individual characters there and, and use that in, in a few places. We could use a more elegant syntax there, but that's not that many cases uh, places in the code. And for single string, for single character things, like if you had some place in the code that wanted to replace that uh, P in a circle with the text. You could, you could already use that 
um, syntax that I put there, and, and, and that works already. So, yeah, as I said, we're kind of reached a, reached a spot where we are quite comfortable with for the, for the moment, and maybe even for the foreseeable future, unless somebody gets enthusiastic and, and wants to bump baselines again. So that's 11 and 14. Um, next standard that's coming up will be C++ 17, which is already quite stable and finished. And the assumption is that compilers will pick that up um, more or less quickly. And especially some of the sugar type of, of uh, improvements there, I want to go th through some of them because um, compilers will probably uh, pick up the, the more trivial or more easily implemented sugar stuff um, fastest, and it still can, can, can bring some benefit to, to how we write code. Um, so one is this uh, new syntax. Um, the problem is you, you, have a, you have a function that returns uh, multiple things, like uh, if you have a container and you insert, you, you call the insert function, um, then it returns a pair of the iterator where it got inserted and a Boolean flag whether it actually inserted it or whether the element was already there and then the iterator will point to the existing element. Um, so there's a new syntax now to bind multiple variables simultaneously to the return values uh, of a function. Uh, this could return a pair, or it could return a tuple, or it could return an array even. Um, so there's, and, and there's also, you can also use that um, with some, some way with, uh, with your own classes. You can declare how your class would be destructured into binding to multiple variables. Um, but this is kind of like the, the, most, the most simple use case for it. You have a pair that gets returned in the old code that is down there. You would have used first and second to operate on the members of that. Now you can give them, give them uh, easily used names. Um, this pairs nicely with the next um, new feature, which is initializers in if statements. That's similar to how you can declare variables that are local to a for loop. Now you will be able to do that also for if and for switch statements so that you don't pollute the, the outer namespace with having these names that are only useful within your, your if. Um, like, for example, if you pair that with, a, with the decomposition uh, or destructuring bindings, um, you see how, how elegantly you now uh, declare some variables, then have the test on that in that one statement and inside of that uh, if block, you can use that. Um, so I assume that'll, that'll things that will come more or less quickly to a compiler near you. Um, one more thing is the context expression if uh, feature where I um, yeah, look for an example that we actually have in the code that would benefit from that. Um, and I found one that is um, yeah, maybe not the ideal example, but, but it does show um, the benefit um, of these. The, the, the idea is uh, that you have an if expression, an if statement um, that is evaluated at compile time and where only one of the two branches, the, the branch that is actually taken, needs to be uh, meaningful. Both of them have to be syntactically valid because the compiler, of course, needs to parse past the closing bracket of the other branch. Um, but the, um, it doesn't uh, go, go into that uh, branch and doesn't uh, look into it more closely. Um, so, for example, uh, the code at the, at the bottom is um, we have some place where we do some... Um, some template uh, trickery on on different uh, kind of kind of enums with their underlying types, and they could be uh, 
signed or unsigned, and we want to check whether some, some actual value is non-negative. So for the case where we are unsigned, if we would actually write um, value greater or equal than zero, then the compiler would warn that this is an unsigned, so it would never be less than zero. So we would get a compiler warning. So to avoid that warning, because we want to be warning free, of course, um, so what do we do? We do some even more heavy trigger, uh, trickery on, on top of that with standard enable if stuff. So we have two functions. Um, actually, the one is only enabled if, if the type is signed, and then we do the actual uh, uh, comparison against zero, and the other one is only enabled if it's an unsigned type, and then we always return true because it can't be negative. Um, that's much more intuitively written with a const expression if thing, where you actually see what's going on instead of having this um, blob at the bottom where you have to decide uh, uh, what's that all about, and, and then it's something trivial, as you can see uh, in the upper code block. So that's always, or, uh, also something that will much improve readability of the code. So um, next thing up is that as of lately, um, we have a new um, Garrett Jenkins uh, build board. So whenever you commit some patch to Garrett, then uh, different Jenkins bots will test out, try out your, your patch, see if it compiles, see if it doesn't produce any warnings. We had bots that run on, on, on uh, Linux, on Mac, and on Windows. What we didn't check so far is the Linux with Clang and all the plugins uh, compiler tool chain. And uh, our, our plugins are very um, picky by now. Um, so it, it often happens that people commit some patches that have sometimes trivial, sometimes not so trivial issues that the plugins warn about, the Clang plugins. Um, so what we now have is a fourth bot that is triggered on every Garrett patch submission um, that is now checking that patch on the plugins, the, the Clang plugins uh, build. Um, for now, that means that there is, for every Jenkins report for your uh, Garrett patch, there is two lines uh, of, of, of uh, builds that are triggered, and when you click on the one for the uh, the Garrett uh, the 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 Clang version, um, then you get to a page where it, where the where it says default, which is a bit unlucky uh, because you might get lost on that page. But if you if you click on that default, then you can go to the to the output. So if it says that it failed, then you'll need a two hop um, to get to to why it failed. Um, Norbert. He's not here at the moment, I think. He told me that he'll improve that so that we are, again, back with, a, with only one status report for all four bots um, so that confusion uh, will go away. But I wanted to show it to you what it looks like today so that you're uh, not confused by now having two lines of success or failure mails for your um, patches. So if you do get a failure for that, please do look, do these hops to see why it failed um, oftentimes, I said it, it's trivial things like there is a plugin to check that you didn't use the null macro but instead used C11 null pointer, or there's a plugin that checks whether um, a, function, a trivial function could be, member function could be static. Um, so these are also uh, easily fixed. Then there's more uh, beefy ones like one checking for misuses of VCL pointer stuff um, where you can. Uh, it, it's not okay, for example, to do these on, on heap, uh, on, on, on the stack, to create them on the stack and stuff like that, so we check for that. Um, so if there's any, uh, if any of the reports that you get, um, you don't understand or don't know what, how to fix them, um, I think you'll always reach somebody on the mailing list or on IRC to, to uh, clarify that or to get that sorted out. But uh, please do look after them, um, because otherwise when the when the, once the, they hit the master, 
um, then the next person who submits a patch, of course, will run into the same uh, build breaker because the master is already poisoned. Um, so um, after this, I come to the second part. The food part is actually about uh, shooting in your food with C++. Um, always a favorite, never going away. And I once again have a look through our commits and code and, and uh, identified some of the more amusing things that you might want to look out for. Um, one is the auto thing. What's bad about this um, little piece of code where somebody um, rewrote existing code to use, use the new for um, statement, the range-based for, um, where looks good. Is it good? No. What happens is that we create a copy for every iteration through the loop um, because what a map uh, begin. So, so what happens in the, in the actual for loop is that you call from begin to end, you get the iterators into the, into the map um, and then work on them, name this R label. Um, what you actually get back is not a pair of a U string and a U string, but a, a pair of a key and a value and the key is, is always const. So that standard pair is different from the standard pair that we have up there. So the compiler internally creates a copy of that um, because you can, you can implicitly convert from, the, from one to the other, but it needs to do a, a copy a conversion, a, a, a create a copy, a temporary for that. Um, so this code above is actually quite suboptimal. Is that? But I guess I was understandable anyway. Good. Um, so the easy fix, as always, is don't specify your types because you typically get them wrong. So just use an auto and, and everything is solved and there's no, there's no issue. Um, something also to do with uh, containers, something amusing, some amusing new syntax in C++14 that is, is um, so-called transparent containers. You might never have heard of them before. Um, the problem is you have some structure or some class um, that you want to use in a, in a set and each element of that uh, class already has a defining uh, some identity like you have a string that represents it and a unique string. So you don't want to have a map from these strings to these items because each item already contains that string so that would be kind of redundant, so you use a set of these items. Um, but then, how do you actually access the element from the set with a given identity? Um, so there was some very funny code, um, some old code in there that went to great lengths and I distilled it down to, to what it did. Um, it defined one static object of this item type and whenever you wanted to search or search the set um, for, for an element, you, you only have that find function on the set that takes an item. You don't have a find function that takes only a string. Um, so you had a static, why it was static, I don't know, but it even adds to the fun of, of, of how overdosed that was. So you, you, you have a static uh, assign the idea to it, and, and then you, um, you, you use that one item uh, to search in that set of items. Um, what you, of course, do in C++11 with that is um, that you don't use find, where you have to put in an actual item object, um, but you use find if, where you specify a condition what the, what, what, uh, on, 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 on a feature of that item only, and you specify that um, you find one where the ID matches. What you can do with C++14 is uh, 
something that looks very funny, you, you change your set to be a so-called transparent set, and you do that with that funny little syntax there. So if you ever run across that syntax and wonder what that means, that's uh, just uh, what this is. It's so-called transparent containers. So what that does is the find function, whatever you put into the find function, needs no longer be an actual object of type item, but it's just some arguments that are forwarded to the internal comparison function. So what this find actually does in code is, of course, at some point it needs to compare an element in the set with this argument that you pass in. And you use uh, perfect forwarding internally for these arguments. Um, and they are, they are used to actually compare. So if you then also define the necessary comparison operators between an item and a string, both ways, um, then this will magically work and uh, no longer need um, to create an item just for the sake of searching for an item uh, with the same ID. So this is just once more. Um, another thing that happens uh, sometimes, but for which luckily at least Clang, I think this is a Clang warning that gets emitted so we don't run into these. Um, this is a case of um, creating um, an object and uh, then returning it by value. Um, so a, a unique pointer in this case gets returned by value from the, from the function. Um, and there's this um, return value optimization so that you don't create additional copies of it when you return it out. So um, per standard, the, 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 there should be some, some copy when you move it out of it, but you can, uh, you don't, the, the compiler doesn't need to, to emit that copy in, uh, construction actually. Um, so you can, you can spare a copy there. But um, by um, changing this old code to use unique, standard unique pointer, um, probably before that it used a, a pointer or some, a naked pointer or something, uh, the person who did that ac accidentally inserted a standard move there because, maybe, probably because they thought um, unique pointers always need to be moved. Um, but what happens in that case is that that doesn't buy you anything, so there's no advantage in, in having a move there, but it also pessimizes your code by formally disallowing that return value optimization. So because there's now no longer only the name of a local variable that gets returned out, um, standard says you can't um, elide the copy construction so this is, our, uh, this is actually not making the code better in any way. It, it makes the code worse. Um, so alway, always in return statements, be wary of using standard move because it never improves things and typically um, makes them worse, also in the cases where you return a temporary. Um, but as I said, there's a compiler warning for that. So at least with one compiler. And... Uh, any questions? Am I way too fast, way above? <laughs> so I come to some uh, lighter part now, some, some fun trivia um, at the end, um, quiz time. Uh, so can a virtual function be defined as deleted, do you think? Does that make any sense? Opinions. A clear maybe. Uh, yes, 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 it can actually. Um, does it make any sense? I don't know. Uh, it, it actually also doesn't result in. I thought maybe that would result in a in a in a class with with no V table, just the RTTE information. But actually, at least the the GCC and then Clang uh, ABI does have a a, a slot there uh, to, a, to to this deleted virtual 
stub that then aborts your program if it should ever be called. Um, you can extend that to, can a pure virtual function, a pure virtual, can it override a non-pure one? Does that make any sense? Undecided as well. Um, so yes, that, that works as well. <laughs> and that one actually could be useful because there's some places in the code where we um, have virtual functions that uh, should never be called and we have some asserts in there. Um, so we could either um, make them um, pure or, um, or, or deleted and uh, that could actually be used to clean up a, a few places in the code. Um, yeah. Is that it? 